We know, we're now going to start a discussion of multiple linear regression, which is regression with more than one predictor. Well, I should say the, word, um, the term regression is kind of unusual. You might be wondering, why linear regression? It's a linear model. Uh, and this is actually, it is an unusual term. It's, it's actually historical. It comes from the idea of regression towards the mean, which is a concept which, which was uh, discussed in the early 1900s. Uh, you might want to look that up yourself, and uh, later on in the course we'll describe what, 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 what regression towards the mean is. But it's, it's resulted in this sort of unusual name for, 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 uh, for a linear model called um, linear regression. But we have to live with this term because it's become sort of time-honored. So multiple linear regression now extends the simple model to we have more than one predictor. Like in this, our example, we have three predictors. Right? So we want to fit them all together and use them all together to predict the outcome. So here's the model. We have a, an overall intercept term, and then we have a slope for each of the predictors in the model, which again, the, the, the betas are the parameters, they're, they're unknown, and the x's are observed, and we're trying to use the x's to predict y. So in the advertising example, to be particular, we'll, we'll have the three predictors, TV, radio, and newspaper advertising, and we're going to try to predict sales. And we have the error term for allowing points to deviate around the, the function. And now the function actually is a, it's a, called a hyperplane. Let's actually flip ahead to slide 19 for a moment. I have a picture of this. So whereas before we had a line, now it's a hyperplane. Okay? So I've been able to draw it here just for two predictors. Um, it's hard to draw it for three. But now we th the line is now replaced by this flat surface called a plane or hyperplane. Okay? So here's our data points. For each point, we have its two predictor values. Let's say TV and newspaper. And we have its sales on the vertical axis. And, we're, and each, here's each data point is a red point. We're going to, what, what, what multiple regression does, it fits a hyperplane, a plane, to these points to minimize the square distance between each point and the closest point in the plane. Right? Very intuitive. In the same way we did it with for a line, now the line becomes a plane. Okay, so let's now go back to the. Okay, so the model again. So this is a it's an equation of hyperplane, with its coefficients. Okay. Well, before we talk about the uh, least squares estimates and some of the details, let's s sort of uh, step back for a moment, think about how we might interpret the regression coefficients, because now there's more than one of them. In the, in, in the simple model, we had only one to deal with. Now we have a multiple, say, three coefficients. How do we interpret them uh, together? Well, um, if the predictors had no correlation, in other words, in the data, then we could talk about each, each, predict, each coefficient separately. We, we, could, we can make statements like a unit change in xj, for example, is associated with the beta j change, that's its coefficient, in the outcome, with all the other, other variables fixed. But um, predictors are not usually uncorrelated in the, in the data. For example, here, we can expect, and we'll see, that actually, the, that the, the, uh, the various amounts spent on the three kinds of advertising are, quite, are correlated. So these kind of interpretations are difficult. And uh, in, 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 these, in, in observational data where they're correlated. What, what, is, what, ha, what, what problem does the correlation cause? Well, the variance of all coefficients tend to increase, sometimes dramatically. In particular, imagine we have two predictors which are, which are almost identical, right? Then we can't really separate their coefficients, right? If I have a coefficient on one variable, I could just as soon move that coefficient to, to, to the other variable, and the fit of the model is going to be pretty much the same. So the variance of the coefficients of those two predictors are going to be very, very large, right? Um, and then interpretation becomes difficult when there's correlation, because if one can't really say, suppose I were to change xj. In other words, if we can think about, suppose I was to change, I was to increase the TV advertising by a certain amount. What would be the effect on sales? Well, if that happened, we, might as we probably wouldn't be reasonable to assume that the other advertising budgets stay the same. For example, maybe the company has a fixed budget overall, so that if I increase TV advertising, I would have to decrease the other advertising. Or maybe TV advertising is increasing just because I, the company has more money in general and, and decides it wants to spend more on advertising of all kinds. So this is an, in both those cases, we, can't, we don't re really, can't really talk about 
the change of one predictor where the other one's fixed because the, the predictors will tend to move together in, in, the, in real data. And what this means is claims of causality should be avoided, right? We can't really say that one predictor causes the outcome when there's, when there's predictors um, in the system that are correlated with that given predictor. So this becomes a, a complicated um, challenge to try to discuss causality, and we're going to avoid that. And there's a nice book which actually I was when I was a graduate student. I was one of the books I I learned from, Data Analysis and Regression by Mostello and Tukey, two very famous statisticians. Um, and I look at the book now, and it's, I don't really I don't like the book that much overall. But there's one wonderful chapter on. Uh, called the, Wo the Woes of Regression Coefficients, that talks about uh, the, the problems of interpreting regression coefficients when there's in a multiple regression model. That's a very useful chapter to read. And I've made this point, so the first point here I've just made, that um, the regression coefficient, what it measures is the change in y per unit change in xj with all other predictors held fixed. But this is not usually a reflection of reality, because usually when you change one predictor, the others change as well. I mentioned the example with advertising. So here's, here's um, a couple of examples which I'll ha just have you think about, um, and maybe we'll put it on a quiz, but here's an example, to, the first example to have you think about this point. Suppose I measure the total amount of change in your pocket, um, and I, that's y, but I also measure th two predictors, the number of coins and the number of pennies, nickels, and dimes. That's x2. Now, by itself, the regression coefficient of y on the total number of pennies, nickels, and dimes would probably be positive, right? The more you have of these, the more likely that you have more change. But what about if I have x1 in the model? Right? So if, for a given level of x1, um, th think about whether the coefficient of x2 will be positive or negative. Okay? And, and we'll, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll talk about the answer to this later on, but that's, it's a simple example where you can see now how the effect, how, how the presence of one predictor affects the way that we think about, interpret the coefficient of another predictor. And of course, these two predictors are highly correlated by construction. Another example, which is actually from this book, this chapter in this book, um, from, from American football. Why is the, the, um, the, the number of tackles by a football player in a season, uh, W and H are his height and weight? And they, they imagine that they, they take data on from this situation, they fit a, a regression model, and they obtain, you know, a, a beta zero, but, a, but the coefficient of weight is 0 0.50. Coefficient of height is minus 0 0.10, which seems to say that it's better to be short um, to make more tackles. But the, so the question we're asking here is, how would you interpret this coefficient of height given the weights in the model? And again, think about this, and we'll return to the answer later. And they, they, they also mention in that same book, there's two quotes, essentially by George Box, who was another famous statistician. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So this is uh, it's interesting, because it's true that, as we saw like on the very first slide, the regression model, a linear model, is never exactly right, but, some, but it's often very useful. So it's, it's important to remember that the model that you assume is you know, not, to not to take it too seriously. Test out your model. Um, remember that it's going to be wrong, but, uh, but uh, also remember the fact that despite the fact it's, it can be, it's an approximation, it can, be, it can be a very useful approximation in many situations. And then this point in their chapter, also paraphrasing George Box, which really uh, sort of it sums up the, what I talked about trying to interpret regression coefficients. The only way to find out what will happen when a complex system is disturbed is to disturb the system, not merely to observe it passively. In other words, if you want, you want to make a causal um, statement about a predictor for an outcome, you actually have to be able to take the system and perturb that, that particular predictor, keeping the other ones fixed. That will allow you to make a ca causal statement about um, a variable like xj in its effect on the outcome. It's not good enough simply to observe uh, um, some, some observations from the system. We can't use that data to conclude causality. So if you want to know what happens when a complex system is perturbed, you have to perturb it. You can't simply observe it. 
So I think that's a very, very wise thing to remember, uh, a, a, a wise summary of the, of the, the, the use of models and observational data. Okay, so how do we uh, find the least squares estimates for the multiple regression model? Well, it's really very much the same, the same uh, tack we took for the simple model. So our, first of all, our, 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 predicted our, our predictions will be given by this equation. This is the intercept. And the, now we remember we have one slope parameter for each predictor. We put hats on there as we always will when we um, infer that value from data, the, 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 the estimates. And now the, what's called the multiple least squares estimates are the values that, that minimize the sum of square deviations of points around the plane. Remember that, let's go, remember I had to show this picture. Here's my d data points. Here's my approximating least squares plane. And I'm gonna choose the orientation and height of this plane to minimize the total square distance between the red points and their closest point on the hyperplane. Right? Those are called the least squares estimates. I'm gonna call the, the multiple least squares estimates because there's multiple predictors. Okay, there's actually, there's, there is a formula for these coefficients, for the estimates. It's, it's kind of messy, and it's not something that you, one ever computes by hand, although probably in the early 1960s, people used to do these, poor guys used to actually compute least squares estimates by hand. They were good at doing um, matrix computations, but today we have the, the luxury of fast computers, and you know, in a program like R or any other statistical package, we can compute the least squares estimates for very big data sets very quickly. So we don't need to worry about the formula. We just need to know what we're doing, which is, we're finding this, the values of the coefficients that minimize the, the uh, sum of squares. So here's what we get for uh, the advertising data. The, um, the top table are the coefficients, standard errors, et cetera. So here's, here's the, these are the least squares estimates. Again, we, there's a lot of terminology here, coefficient or parameter We'll use those interchangeably, and as people do. The intercept, again, we're not typically interested in the intercept because that's just telling us whether the setting the other three predictors to zero, whether the um, sales is uh, the average, uh, the average um, sales value. So we don't really care about that, but we care about the slopes, which are these guys, these three values here. So we see, for example, the coefficient of TV is 0.046, standard error, the t-statistic is the ratio, 0.046 divided by 0 0.0014. And the t-statistic, remember I said a t-statistic of a bigger than about 2 is significant at 0.05, p-value 0.05. P-value, so the p-value of 32 is huge, and the p-value is less than 0 0.0001. Similarly for radio, very big effect. Newspaper, newspaper looks like it's not having much effect. Right? Its t-statistic is minus 0.18 which has got a p-value which is large. And p-value is close to 1. P-values above 0.05 or, or 0.1 are not significant. They're not, they're not um, um, evidence against the null hypothesis, which is the coefficient is 0. So, but let's, let's be a little more careful how we interpret this. Remember, each of these statements is made conditional on the other two being in the model. So, in particular, this, this coefficient says, Given I, I have the, uh, the amount of money spent on radio and newspaper, um, spending money on TV is still produces a change in, the, in, the, in sales. So it's, in the presence of the other two predictors, TV is important. Similarly for radio, in the presence of TV and radio advertising, excuse me, TV and newspaper advertising, radio advertising can be effective but newspaper is not, in the presence of these two. So, in particular, on its own, newspaper um, may be significant, its coefficient may be significant, but in the presence of the other two, in the multiple model, it's not showing significance. And we can look at the correlations, actually, here. Here are the, here are the simple correlations between the predictors. Um, and we see there's some significant correlations. For example, TV and sales, well, TV sales is the outcome, but um, in particular, let's see, radio and newspaper have a correlation of 0 .2, 0 0.35. So what's likely happened here is that 
any any effective newspaper has been soaked up by radio, right? Because they're, they're correlated at 0.35. So, with radio in the model, newspaper is no longer needed. It doesn't tell us anything more. It doesn't it doesn't improve the prediction given we've measured the radio advertising, and that's because of the correlation being 0.35. On the other hand, it looks like TV and radio are pretty uncorrelated, and so they, their effects are somewhat uh, complementary. So th that completes our discussion of this example. In the next segment, we'll talk about some important questions that arise when you use regression in, for real data analysis.